thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we think this is a really, really important topic uh, that we've been wanting to engage with for, for quite a while now. And this, is, this seemed like a, a really good opportune moment at the start of the year. My name is Lewis Ryder-Jones, for those of you who've not met me. I am the Deputy Chief Executive at the Alliance. I just wanted to first highlight something that I think is really important today. And that is that I would like this to be a really open space where we learn together. Um, the discussion today is obviously about language and language that we use collectively to talk to each other and the wider world. I, I suppose therefore the key is just that we are open to everyone else's ideas and that we are also open to finding new ways of expressing ourselves. I think this is really important again. Um, this is not a meeting where we're telling you what we're doing. I hope the paper was framed in a way that, 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 that helped express that. We're really here to critically assess our own language use and for you to help us do that and hopefully all of us can help each other doing that. We're framing this through the international development sector's lens uh, but obviously this matters for all sectors and is a, a part of a much wider discussion so um, just to, to, to be open and honest about that we're coming at this from an international development perspective. Um, we want to share ideas and identify gaps in the draft paper um, and if possible, we'd like to kind of build a consensus with you on a way forward for language use at the Alliance and drawing some lines in the sand on things that we'll stop using. And I think that's something we should be seeking to try and do. Um, finally, we also want to improve how we can uh, support you, our members, um, around wider issues relating to racial injustice and uh, anti-racism. So I'm going to share again, I'm going to give a, a really short presentation in a minute uh, just to kind of go over um, the, the, the background to this paper and, and, and some of the key points but I think before I start that I want to make a really quick statement. I guess I, I, I'm saying this because I want to set the tone for the discussion. I also want to uh, set the right uh, tone for my role as chair and acknowledge a couple of things and, and recognise something important and that and that's simply that uh, I'm fully aware cognizant and acknowledge and acknowledge my intersectional privilege if that's a way to put it around being quite Scottish British European relatively fit and healthy able-bodied um, educated and male um, and I think just setting that uh, out and saying that publicly I think uh, helps me acknowledge that my identity is intertwined and intersectional but also that uh, I know that those privileges uh, form biases within the way that I approach things and that um, I need to be ready to challenge those biases that that, that privilege can sometimes fuel um, and, I, and I guess I'd also like to say that, that, that myself and the team members at the Alliance who've been involved in this work to date uh, don't really don't claim to have any of the right answers on this stuff uh, we've tried to ask some of the the questions that we think are important uh, and we really want to be consistent with our own values as an organization but that's really it we, we're coming to you as a kind of open book in that sense we want you to fill in the pages um, and we really want to to take some of that stuff further asking more questions and, and building consensus with you so um yeah, 2020 was a tumultuous year, wasn't it? Um, unprecedented on almost every level you can imagine. Um, and I suppose one thing that stood out to a lot of us and probably why a lot of you are here today is that uh, the heightened attention to institutional and systemic racism um, that was catalyzed by the tragic murder of George Floyd last spring. Um, and then of course, just the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic emphasizing structural inequalities, laying them bare for all to see, uh, f further emphasizes some of these issues that, 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 that got this heightened attention and continues to have it. Uh, all of this for me really comes to one point. We need to confront racial injustice more actively and better in everything that we do, um, but injustice more widely um, as well, but particularly racial injustice. 
uh, for those of us who work in international development, uh, which itself, based on comments uh, in the draft document, is perhaps a loaded term filled with a Western understanding of what development and international means. Uh, this is about a whole host of really complex issues that are underpinned by the legacies of colonial rule. Uh, reflecting on these gets the, to the very essence of what we do and why as a sector, um, and doing so could potentially help let us uh, help us let go of outdated modes of thinking. Um, although we know it's obviously not necessarily a panacea for for the the broad system change, we know that dealing with some of these systemic injustices is really uh, about. Um, so that's one part of this, and, and, and the, very, the very baseline importance. But then there's also this other thing. I think I, I, I'm allowed to say I'm happy we'll never have to see that face again as a president, or I hope not. Um, but his face uh, is representative and symbolic of a big problem in society globally, particularly in in in, uh, in uh, economically rich countries in um, Western Europe and North America. Um, because all this heightened attention to, to, to the importance of anti-racism is hit against this backdrop, backdrop of a kind of politics that is epitomized by this man and, and the outgoing politics that he represented. Um, we've witnessed uh, over the last four years in the US uh, a really extreme version of, quite frankly, stuff that's playing out here and in other countries too. And we must recognise that. Divisiveness, right-wing nationalism um, are both a product of and a fuel for structural inequalities, uh, particularly around race. Um, and for those of us who wish to see global cooperation to reduce these same inequalities, tackle poverty, find solutions to global issues that we all share, uh, 2020 uh, also oversaw some really big changes in the UK that really question the direction that the UK government is headed in, in, in the same regard. Um, there's another side to this from regular polling carried out by various organisations over the last few years. We know that the majority of British people just aren't that interested with what the Department for International Development did prior to its um, closing its doors or what official development uh, assistance is used for and, and why it's important. Um, and we know it's really tough, those of us who work with uh, fundraising, um, in fundraising roles uh, for some of the bigger agencies around international development, it's really tough to bring in new supporters. And we often speak in an echo chamber uh, that reaffirms this division between the interested and the disinterested. Um, but it's not all bad because we also know that the majority of people uh, aren't lacking in empathy or they aren't mean. Um, social justice, particularly in Scotland, but everywhere garners and maintains strong support. Um, so what's going on then? Well, uh, I don't know is the answer to that, but what, what's clear is we need to work out why the UK government particularly and potentially a future Scottish government uh, can push through policy changes that limit that collective capacity to tackle global problems and poverty and inequality uh, with limited uh, public outcry. Um, why wasn't that there? Um, I think some of the answers to these questions lie in our language. Um, is it about the inaccessibility of it? Is it about the jargon we use? Um, um, can we really talk about innovation and, and, and have meaning? What, do, what is innovation? Um, is it that we speak about global poverty in a way that removes the human to human connection. Um, some of us are much better at doing that than others. Uh, has the pro professionalization of international development disconnected it from uh, diaspora communities who do their own form of international development um, and disconnected from the energized youth volunteer campaigners passionate about social justice all over the world? I think perhaps possibly yes, we need to do something about it. Um, but maybe it's all these things, probably is, you know. Um, so with that kind of backdrop in mind, we thought, well, I've been looking at different 
things in this area that, that can help us. It was clear that some draft principles would be necessary. So they then form the start of the discussion on language itself. So what are these draft principles? Well, they're in the paper. I can't fit them all in one slide, so I'm not going to bother trying. Uh, but the, the principal point here is that our language choices influence all of the things that we've just laid out. And uh, a guide to how we make these choices might be useful. Um, and we want your input to make that guide as useful as possible. Uh, I think there is a question around balance between uh, not being seen as to police our language as such, but to try and support making the right choices, not, not uh, damning people for making the wrong choices. Um, so there's 11 principles as it stands. Um, we'll come back to them in the discussion. Uh, but really, yeah, it's about, it's about not being overly prescriptive, I think, but also finding that balance and helping us reflect more on the, on the language that we use. So really looking forward to hearing your views on that. Um, yeah, uh, to finish off, um, the rest of the paper goes through some examples and I know lots of you have already read it, so uh, uh, I won't, don't need to go into the examples particularly right now. Um, but it goes through specific examples of language we think that is problematic and there's 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 some there's some big ones in there put it that way uh for me above all else the one we probably hear mostly in our sector and certainly hearing the media talk about the work of our sector it's that word aid or foreign aid and it really bothers me personally um and i'm hoping that you'll see uh, you have a similar view on that. But to move away from that almost seems like an impossibility because I still find myself using that word even though I don't want to. Um, it's just so overused and it's just so meaningless in many ways and doesn't describe the complexities of things. Um, um, and then that gets into another question of, well, do we want to describe complexities to certain audiences? Uh, I think there needs to be that balance. But regardless, this is about creating and reinforcing a better narrative about why global sustainable development is necessary um, that's open and honest about the past and our connections to and our historical connections to the systems that we want to see a thing of the past uh, and I think it's it, it's about progress uh, presenting that progressive vision for the future and about being really ambitious with that vision uh, while, while staying rooted in, 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 in the realities of problems that people face. Um, so we lay out some language that we think needs a bit more discussion with all of this in mind. And we, we also lay out some gray areas uh, that I really want to expand and try and find some consensus around. Um, and then we also put a, a list of resources at the bottom. So if we could expand this to get it into a publishable format, fantastic. Um, and if we if, if if we need to keep this as an ongoing draft document for members only, then that then then that's the right course of action. Then great. Um, so that's almost it for me. Um, uh, is it wise to link our desire to decolonize language with the need to build public support? I'm conscious that there's something self-serving about the the idea of building public support. Uh, but I'm also a strong believer in political change and system change coming out from this, the, coming from a need and a desire from the public. So there's two sides to that coin. Um, so I'd be really interested to hear views on, on how we approach decolonizing language and our reasons for doing it. Um, our draft principles, I, I mentioned them before. Is there anything missing? Are they fit for purpose? Um, what about the words that we think should be avoided? You know, we've, we've suggested aid and foreign aid. We've put in quite a few others. Uh, are these the right words to have in there? Uh, would we need to think about other alternatives? Are our alternatives fit for purpose that we've suggested? And is there anything to add to that list? Um, also the gray areas, do they need unpacking more? I think almost certainly, but are there other gray areas that we've not thought of? Um, how do we make language more accessible to the public? Uh, and how can we make our work more relevant to all people? So this comes, comes in at the end and at the moment feels slightly like an add-on to the rest of the discussion, but I think it's really important from a communications perspective and a desire to, to again, go back to that broad system change question that we, that we really think about bringing the public with us because that's ultimately what we all want to see. Um, so how can we do that? Is there any learnings from other movements that we can take or other sectors? 
I think we're going to finish there, be not because there's not enough to say, just because we've run out of time, sadly. Uh, we've got one or two other things we want to do. One of them is about that next steps, about training the wider issues of anti-racism and dealing with de 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 uh, decolonizing lots of what we do, not just language. Um, and uh, uh, there's a question on inclusivity, which we just touched upon and Fiona mentioned at the end. We're fully supportive of that and want to facilitate that broader conversation. Uh, there's a point here about uh, how far this document goes as to whether it's a toolkit or it's prescriptive. Uh, I feel like a toolkit is a better way to approach it. It's about asking, helping each other to ask the right questions in the right context. The document itself is a place where we can feedback. And as Laura said, we're always open to, to, to discussions. This can't be owned by the Alliance Secretariat being the staff and, 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 and led on this instance by me. It must be owned by you, our members and, and, and your partners. Uh, take care everyone uh, have a lovely uh, afternoon the rest of it and uh, stay safe and well and thank you again for joining us